All of a sudden, quiet descends. Okay, you got to make it through the next hour and a half without sleeping. You can do it. You can do it. Um, what I thought I would do is um, just talk to you a little bit about the challenges that I see in that we hold in our field of consciousness as a prelude to going into gravity, in the field of gravity, um, in the field of what I would call mystical weightlessness. Um, without a doubt, what the mystics have shared that holds them together in, in terms of their literature and certainly in their experience. And what I think is one of the greatest obstacles within us is how much we trust our reason to be our guide. How much we rely upon reason how much we value a reasonable choice and making a reasonable decision. When in fact, the last thing we are is reasonable. The truth is, the last thing you are is a reasonable being. You are, I, I could make you hysterical in, the, in, the, in that easy of a thing. Right below the surface, we are all functioning hysterics. <laughs> okay, now this is what's true. It's a great illusion that you are a reasonable person. It's a great illusion. It is a great illusion that you can be reasoned with nine out of 10 times. Is that not true? Okay, so when you think of yourself, when you think about how much you, quote, rely and look for reasons as, for why, as to why things happen as they do, think about that whole irony when, in fact, you are not fundamentally a reasonable person. Are you with me here? Okay, one of the reasons why people don't get through crises is that a belief that you have is that you have a reasonable or, or, or is that the universe should be reasonable or orderly. And it will never, ever, ever be that. And here's, here's what I think is so astounding to me. Even though the universe will never, ever be that, you can't stop wanting the universe to be what it will never, ever be. And you simply insist on torturing yourself with wanting it to be what it can never, ever be. Which is, it's got to become reasonable or orderly. It simply has to. I need to make it reasonable or orderly, and, and, and maybe tomorrow it will be. But it never is. And if you think about it, think about... These are the kinds of things that if you pause to reflect on, you would, it almost takes your breath away. How many of the crises in your life and how many of the people you fear, how many of the things that are issues for you are exactly that because what that person represents is the ability to, dis to disturb and disrupt what you think is your stability, your stability which is, that person is unreasonable. That person might make me face the truth that I have no control over anything. And how dare anyone introduce the idea that I don't have control over something. Are, are you following this here? Okay, because what, now I'm gonna turn this into a cosmic thing. Because on the other end of this spectrum, on the other end is the mystical experience, and the mystical experience is fundamentally an experience in which God calls you to become out of control. 
is become where you in fact enter into an out of control experience with your with divine force. Hmm. It's a wild thought. The, the tragic part about divinity is that I can't give you an example of it that makes you go, oh my God. It's just more words. If I could only conjure up that and have you elevated and lifted off and give you lift off, if I could only just for a second say, okay, and the next thing you know, you would be like Teresa of Avila floating above the ground. But it's not possible. So at any rate, I learned to, to appreciate the role that reason plays and the torment that it brings precisely because of Teresa. And I will tell you this, and we'll go into, uh, I'm going to take us into, oh, John, you are the berries. Did you bring my pizza? Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, thank you. So this is what I want to tell you. It's story time about Teresa of Avila and then into John of the Cross and the seven passions and shadows. Um, when I wrote Why People Don't Heal years and years, years just a few years ago, <laughs> the, <laughs> the thing about why people don't heal was at that point I was just interested in a, a pattern of woundology, but that book too was born here at Finhorn. Oddly enough, it was born here in uh, the way in which it all hit me, downloaded when I was at Clooney and I was meeting someone for lunch. I was at, uh, the, it was in the dining room and I was having lunch with two, I was sitting with two gentlemen and a friend approached the table, and then another friend named Eric Franciscus, who no longer lives here, but he did at that time for many years. Maybe some of you remember Eric. John does. And Eric said to this one community member, are you free on June 8th? Helen Caldicott is coming here, and she needs an escort around the community. Now, that was a yes or a no question, to which she responded, June 8th? Did you see June 8th? Not June 8th. Any other day. That's an incest survivor's day, and we never let each other down. We're always there. And everyone at the table was like this, because all he wanted to know was, were you free June 8th? Not, and by the way, were you molested, and when was that, and are you still angry, and do you have a support system? All of which came out in her answer. I was astounded by this. Completely astounded. Well, the long and the short of it, it was from that I eventually realized people don't want to heal. There's this whole thing called wound allergy. Okay, fast forward. From that eventually, um, in entering the castle, my learning experience there what took me into the mystical realm. And in the mystical what is the difference between like the psychological and the mystical? Because where we're working for the rest of the weekend is deeply in the mystical territory of who we are. <clears throat> the experience of Teresa, um, when I was shortly before I was 50, I was in standing in my kitchen and I thought, I don't have um, a spiritual life. I don't, I don't have one. I don't have any kind of spiritual practice. And, and then I thought, but I'm so bright, and I read a lot, and that, is, that suffices for a spiritual practice. Now, you see, here's the thing. That's what people like you and me do. What people like you and me do is that we think that because we read a lot and we talk a lot, that that is the same as having a spiritual practice. Because we know a lot, we read a lot, we talk a lot. That that is the same thing as a profoundly deep soul practice. But it's not. If anything, it feeds the arrogance that keeps you away from a profoundly deep soul practice. 
<clears throat> so there I am in the kitchen saying, I don't think I have a spiritual path. And oh well, I read a lot, I tell myself. And you tell yourself you do other things. None of that matters. Okay. Then I write the book, Invisible Acts of Power, in which I study us and the patterns of us that are universally consistent, namely, at some point in our lives, we bottom out. Our lives are destined to bottom out. It fascinates me. Why is that? I think, isn't that curious? But it's absolutely true. At some point, all of our lives are destined to bottom out. Absolutely. I can almost pinpoint it. If you haven't bottomed out yet, I'll tell you exactly when you're going to. Not because I'm psychic, but because it is part of how the soul wakes you up. Bottom out. What I mean by that is that at some point, the life you thought you were determined to live, that you had full control over. Does that work? Okay. And, and it's the life that you thought that you were fully in charge of, and it would work out just this way. The reasonable, and another phrase is to say, we have all our ducks in a row. Everything. And all of a sudden, for whatever reasons, that you have no control over, the unreasonable begins to happen. And it just falls apart. Have any of you been there yet? Have any of you not been there yet? No takers? You haven't. How old are you? 43. You have time. You have time. Give yourself. It's a pleasant, wonderful experience. So wonderful. But here's the thing. What I noticed is those who fare best through this, who survive it the best, who make it through the best, are those who fight it the least. That's number one. And number two are those who, in the end, they emerge with a different set of values. That what's taken away from you in this whole thing are the only thing you're really letting go of are your fears and your values and the world that you scaffolded with all your fears and your values. That that's the only thing that's really getting crushed in the whole thing. Okay. <clears throat> Fascinating. During that time that I wrote that, I thought, you know what? This is interesting because it's exactly like what I, the, the, the sacred stories that I used to read or the scriptural teachings or the holy literature where when a soul is in the journey of getting crushed, heaven says, I am never closer to you. And I thought, my God, this is exactly, exactly like, because I, I, all these people wrote me letters of these experiences. I had 1,200 in 10 days come in. And I was astounded. And it, I just love some of these stories. I love them. This is, and I put them in invisible acts of power. And it was so extraordinary to me because it was in this that I realized how powerful each human being was. It took this book to do it. And I said to you, each one of my books was an aha. Someone could have said to me, a human being is a powerful thing, a powerful force. But again, when I tell you it's not animated, you need something to animate that. That book, this was my experience of falling truly in awe with what is a human being. I don't know that all of you have had that experience. I hope you have it. To appreciate what is a human being. What, what is that? D these experiences, I mean, I, I read 1,200, 1,300 letters from people who wrote how the slightest thing that someone did had this consequence. Okay, so 
you know, like someone who's going to kill himself. He's standing on the corner and he's thinking, I don't know, should I take pills or take a razor and slip my wrist? He's on the corner thinking this. He's thinking, you know, the razor may not be sharp enough. I may not have enough p uh, pills, maybe razor, maybe pills, maybe razor, maybe pills. And just as he's standing there, he looks and the car pulls up to the stop sign. He's waiting for the car to go by, but instead she looks him right in the eye. And she motions for him, no, 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 you go walk across the street. They make eye contact. And in that instant, in that second, in that microsecond, he, just, he chooses to live. Now, she must have been channeling the most profound grace because she healed him. Okay, she healed him. She will never know it. They'll never see each other again. She healed him. Like that. He went his, who knows who he is today, where he is, or who he's healing and what he's doing. Who knows where she is? They will never meet again. It could have been you that he told me about. I look at everyone now and think, was it you when I tell this story? It could have been. You don't know. But the power of someone who has that grace channeling to someone else. Okay, I thought, my God, do human beings have any idea that they have the profoundness to look at another human being consciously and think, God, God, send that light through me to that person. Don't, don't attach your agenda, but just think that person is filled with such negativity, with such evil, that person can do a lot of harm. Just do whatever can come through me to that person, just do it, just do it, just do it. Just let it, just, just do it. That kind of force is what you are. You're that kind of agent of change and it took me that period. And I thought, my God, every human being, up until that time, I thought, yeah, eight human beings are, uh-uh. Now, I look at you and feel you have an obligation to respond to heaven calling you. It's not an option. I don't know how to force that down your throats. If I could, I would. And I no longer, here's something else. In our society that places such a value on youth, I know that as soon as people start with the graying and the older and the they become sedentary, and they think, I'm, it, changing you is not easy. You are not easy to change. You are not easy to move forward. Sometimes it's like trying to push automobiles through mud. It's easier to teach active teenagers who are youthful and exuberant and just beginning and you are not full of excuses as to why not to do that. And fearful, no, 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 and not full of scar tissue and not full of all of this. And yet, I look now and I say, oh no, you don't. I'm not letting you off the hook. That's why God puts a teacher like me with someone like you. Because I'm someone that would say, don't give me that. You can't be let off the hook. You people are people who are now refined through experience and all the more valuable. All the more valuable. And anybody who says, I'm too old now, I can't move forward, I can't be of service, let someone else do something, does not understand the eternity of the soul. So when I started to work with Teresa of Avila, what that then took me to was I was so overwhelmed by human beings. And I went into the world of the sacred and her seven mansions. When I started to teach Teresa, I realized people couldn't grasp what the inner castle, the interior castle was. So I would, on my very first book tour night, 
I said to the audience, do you want to have an experience of the inner castle, the interior castle? And everyone said, yeah, 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 yeah. As if I was taking them to Disneyland. <laughs> and well, I could see, oh, yeah, let's go there. You want to go? Yeah, let's go. So I, I took them into a prayer of the interior castle because one of the things Teresa was very clear about is that you can't get into your interior castle except through prayer. Now, here's the thing about prayer. And that's that I have avoided ever going into prayer, going into any of that, all of my professional life. Because I don't want to deal with anyone saying, and this is what I always found out was so fascinating about the new age. I'm here on a spirituality thing, but don't talk to me about God. What, what is that? Will you tell me what that is with people? Or goddess? Whatever that is. Anyway, so here's the thing. I am going to do the God word. If I hear anything like, um, I don't have any respect anymore for what's called political correctness. I don't respect it. I don't regard it. It is nothing to me. If you have issues with language, take them up with your shrink, but not with me. If you want to read offense into something, spare me. Because to me, the word God is all-inclusive. If you need to hear something else, program it in yourself. That is my rule. Done. Done. Okay, so there we are. So um, when I took people into the castle, it is the difference between the ego and the soul. I did it through prayer. At the end of that first book signing, Somebody came up to me and said, I've been in pain for 20 years. I'm not in pain anymore. After that, at every single book signing, at every single workshop, there was a healing. There was a healing. And, and, and I didn't mean to say this, but Bronwyn experienced a healing. She's here. I didn't mean to put her on the spot or even point that, but she did. Um... And that's not why she's here, but she is somebody who actually experienced a healing in a Teresa workshop. That was one of the reasons I thought, why, how are, is, are people healing when all my other years, all this, why people don't heal all of this? I never saw anyone actually heal, actually heal. Bronwyn's healing, would you say, was 12 hours? Would, would you mind describing what you hear? Could, Hannah, would you, would you mind saying, can I put you on the spot a little bit, Bronnie? But I didn't mean to, but I, now, would you mind listening to this story? I'll, I'll give you the quick version. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Um, I had psoriasis uh, quite chronically all over my body and it affected my life quite considerably and I guess from what Michael was saying before would almost be my own words of, um, during the meditation of the first mansion, when Carolyn asked the question, uh, what is it that I've, as God, what, what is it that God has given you that is too much? And I kind of hunted around and hunted around because I thought it must be something. And uh, my answer was nothing, not even psoriasis. And um, the next morning I got in the shower and, you know, staying in a hotel room, have the whopping great mirrors. And I, something caught my attention because it was different. I've turned around and looked in the mirror, and I literally, half of the psoriasis was gone. And my sort of superstition kicked in because it was like, I can't speak of it because it'll come back. And it continued to get better. Uh, I, I, I have various bouts occasionally now from stress, um, like if I have an incident, I'll get a, a, a patch, whatever. I have small amounts, but nothing compared. Um, it's 90% gone to what it was. And if anyone has had psoriasis or knows anyone with psoriasis, it, it, it is debilitating in its own way. Um, it affects the clothes you wear. Every, I mean, everything, everything, relationships, everything. And um, it's had a... Prof a profound, profound effect on my life to, to have that gone. 
And, it, and there's no way I could have done it on my own. Hmm. No. Okay. <clears throat> so, it was one healing after another like this. It brain tumors, uh, breast cancer, blindness, blindness. So, um, you know, one has to say, how is this happening? Not how, from my point of view, not how, but what would I have to do to facilitate that? Is there anything I can do to facilitate this as a next step for other people? What is it that I could bring forward? Because I, I don't need to know how. I have no problem with the manner in which heaven interacts with a human being. But what can I teach that would facilitate that? And that's where defy gravity comes in. And that brings in John of the Cross and the Dark Knight. And <clears throat> where we're going with this. So I want to tell you a little bit about John because that's going to help you understand the significance of the Dark Knight. Did, did you have a question, Annie? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> John of the Cross was a Spanish Carmelite monk who, as it turns out, was Teresa of Avila's companion, uh, spiritual director, for a tiny bit of time. Uh, there was a, a, quite a substantial age difference. Um, someone had said to me recently, oh, they were involved, which is preposterous. Teresa was 52 when they met, and he was 25, and he was only five feet tall. I mean, so, please. But anyway. <laughs> Stop. Anyway. Um, she knew better than that. But uh, John was, and this is just a historic thing that has no significance on the spiritual experience except that it is a historic thing that feeds, served, served it. They were both Carmelite um, in the Carmelite community. She was a nun, he was a priest. At that time in Spain, there was a, a lot of debauchery, so to speak, in the Carmelites, okay? So both of them decided that God was calling them to reform the Carmelite community. Who cares about that? Nobody. But what is important is that they both felt they had a calling. That's the important thing. It doesn't matter what it was toward. What is true is that both felt they had a calling. Now, what does it mean to be called is going to be a significant part Oh, somebody, <laughs> do me a favor and help me. Okay. <laughs> Nothing is ever easy. Okay. What is important, thanks, is that they felt they had a calling. The, the role of a calling is most significant to all of you. It's most significant because you're at a stage in your interior life where you're toying around with that. I don't know that you realize that, but the first stage, the very first stage of stepping into the world is the stage of um, what we would call, you know, I'm gonna do this like chakra time, so I'll do it this way. This is also mansions, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We'll leave these alone. But your first, second, and third chakras, and the power of this, which we'll deal with, which is the first, second, and third mansions, which are also the first, second, and third sacraments. We're going to cover all of these beginning tomorrow. I'm going to lay some groundwork. I will later, thank you. They are Teresa's mansions of the soul, the deeper mansions. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. They are the mansions, the deeper mansions of Teresa's. Teresa of Avila, the interior castle, said that the castle, the soul was a diamond 
It looked to her like a diamond. And in the diamond, there were seven mansions. That's how the soul looked to her. And what's fascinating to me was she said seven. Why did she say seven? Why would Teresa say seven? Nobody told this 15th, 16th century nun about seven chakras living in a Carmelite monastery in Avila, Spain. How did she know seven? She had a vision of seven profound levels of the soul that had to be excavated on a journey of inner illumination. And the difference between the ego and the soul is that your ego is about discovering why things don't work out the way you want. What's the problem here? What's the problem? Why don't I get what I want? And why is everybody just not liking me? What's the source of my power struggles? And I have to learn new power tactics. And I have to express myself better. And it's all about enhancing your narcissism. But the journey of inner illumination is exactly what the word implies, to illuminate, to bring light to you, to become light. And in the mansion, she says, there are seven levels of you. And what you look at are seven levels of self-knowledge. You investigate you, not others, you. And what it is about you that makes you alive. In your first mansion, for example, it's the mansion of chaos, humility, and the destruction of God, and the, and the seduction of God. She says these are the forces of what is also your first, your first chakra. There's a huge difference between the chakra and the mansion, and now the graces and the shadow passion. We put them all together. This is the way I want you to learn them as one huge force field. So you get a sense of all the activity that is in each one of these buzz points in you. Of all the forces that go on in each one of these fields of consciousness. That each, each one of these fields is an almost an entire universe operating within you. But my point here before I went down into the mansions is that I was talking about, wait a minute, I just want to get this out of my way, about the stages of the understanding that everybody has to have a job. In this first level, I want you to understand the three levels of power that, that we're, we are dealing with at all times in life. And below your waist, below your waist, in the first, second, and third chakras, below your waist like a magnetic field, just as if you were in an hourglass, just like an hourglass. This is the field of physical survival, of physical survival. And this part of you, this part of you, this part of your consciousness is all about getting a job. So the first thing you do in life is you have to survive and get a job. And this is something that's really important to understand. Because I'm dealing with the archetype of power and how much power you are going to handle in life. And the speed at which you can control power or abdicate power and people have power over you. And if people have power over you, 
your capacity to heal something or to make a difference is equal in proportion to how much of your power others have over you. Okay. So what is absolutely a given is that all of us start out with a job. We're kids, we're younger. And in a job, at that level of power, you have no authority. None of us has any authority. So what we are programmed, we are programmed to eventually hate our jobs. Because they are repetitious. Because we feel, because what is true is that we feel that we have no authority over our reality. So at some point, this is our ego world. Our sense of self starts pushing against the wall. And it starts saying, I want, I want to be noticed. I want to be recognized. I want to be able to have some kind of influence over the world that I'm standing in. So from job, we move to career. You want to have some kind of influence over your world, no matter what. Whether it's in the job and you get a, what do you call that when you go up? Promotion. promotion. You get a promotion, but you want more authority within the arena. You get it, you move on to a career. A career is where your ego and your sense of self is more individualized. So that when someone says, what do you do? You name a profession. I am a whatever. I now want to tell people I'm an astrobiologist. I just heard about this and I love the way it sounds. So for the rest of the weekend, I'm going to be an astrobiologist. But, um, it's a new profession since 1998, but doesn't that sound neat? What do you do? I'm an astrobiologist. <laughs> I missed my calling. Okay. But at some point during your career years, no matter what you consider your career, it is what you do consciously by choice. I don't care if it's motherhood to fatherhood to gardening, I don't care. The significant thing that makes a career is not education, but that you do it by choice. Do you understand what I just said to you? Is that whatever it is you do, you do by choice. I am here by choice. And that is what makes your, a, a career a career. It is yourself doing it by choice. It is not that you have earned 18 degrees and you are, you know, but that what makes a career, I now believe, is the choice factor. Right there, fifth chakra. It is that I am choosing to do this. I'm not doing this because I can't find anything else. I'm doing this because this is where I want to be. And at some point, even that will begin to feel like these shoes are too tight. And, and you will at some point have a crisis of meaning and purpose. In some way, shape, or form that may be caused by an illness, it may be caused by something, but a crisis of meaning and purpose will strike in some way. And when that happens, you end up in this area, more or less, knocking at heaven's door. And that's when a person is called and your calling begins. The difference, the job, the career, the calling. The thing is that you think that a calling follows the same logical track as a career. That it should have a pension or that it should have a, um, a you know, kind of a logical sort of thing, but it doesn't. 
There's nothing logical about the soul's journey at all. Nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And you might say, how could a suffering begin a calling? Because it usually does. It can, it often does. How can confusion, because that usually does. It usually does. So I'll leave that there. I'm gonna to go to John of the Cross for a minute and finish my introduction of that. Let me say this about John, which is what's so important at this point. And that John, in fulfilling his calling, what often happens with people is that because you do something you feel called to do, there's a part of us that thinks everything should fall into place. Many times people say, I don't understand. I just got this on my radio show the other day. Someone said, I don't get this. I did what I thought was right and nothing's working. Nothing's working in the first, second, or third, or third chakra of the column because so oftentimes we think that things should work out logically according to the way we think working out should map out. My definition of working out looks like this, and that's not how it's working out. So it's, therefore, it's not working out. I should be healing, and this is how the healing should look. It should look like this. This is how the doctors say I should heal, and this is the route. And it should take this long, because that's what they said, and it should look just like this. Okay. But in fact, in this world of disorder, in this world of the mystical context, of a calling, that, that route, the route of chaos, is in fact the most logical order that can be provided you. And it's actually more, chaos is more the order than order is. I know that sounds peculiar, but if you get that, you actually get the more chaotic the path, the more it's an indication you're on the path. I know that sounds strange, but I'm telling you the truth. The more chaotic and disorienting, the more it is, it's actually an indication you're on the path because what is true is left to your own devices you will start trying to control things, but the control always comes out of fear. It never comes out of faith and trust. Therefore, you keep getting blindsided to keep you from getting controlling. Did I say that correctly? You got it. You keep getting blindsided so that your controlling little talons can't get in. Okay, so that's what happened with John of the Cross. He was captured by, kidnapped by his own Carmelite priests while he was trying to reform the order with Teresa of Avila. And here's the thing, he was tortured and tormented. And he kept saying to himself, how could this happen because I was following my calling. And during that time, he wrote The Dark Night of the Soul. It was only a 16-line poem but it's a poem of great mystical content. I mean, if you read it, it's very, very odd. It's very deep. It's very mystical. It's very the kind of thing, oh, beloved, love of darkness. Like you, you have to sit and think, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? So every wording of it is one that you have to scratch your head and say, what are but so that it instantly you know that this is a poem that shatters your reasoning mind. Your reasoning mind can't get this poem. To your reasoning mind, the poem doesn't make any sense. Now that's your first indication you're dealing with a really sophisticated piece of mystical literature. That in order to get this, you have to lean back and hope it lets you in. Like the Psalms. It's so sophisticated that you think, I don't know that I want to go near this. It's so profound. And that's the dark night of the soul. Because what John realized 
was that as he was being tortured by these Carmelites, he, he realized, if I don't find a way to transcend how I feel, my hatred for you, my resentment, if I don't find an alternative route, a loving route, I will become what you're doing to me. I will become it. Number two is what he realized that in order to become a greater form of love, he couldn't get there on his own. He couldn't get there on his own. Now, sit with me through this one because this one is a real tight one to get. This is a real tight passage that we gotta make it through here. Becoming your greater self is something you fear. Now, I've heard people say they fear success. They don't even know what they're talking about. You know what you're talking about. You don't feel fear success at all. But becoming greater than, co coming into unleashing your greater potential to love, Praying that the heart of your own sacred be open is what you fear. And the reason you actually do fear it, that you, you think, here's this narrow gate that's in your heart, and you get to that gate because some horrible experience is happening, and the keyhole's this big, and you start praying in front of that keyhole, God, get me through, because I can't get that through. I can't get through this on my own, but I know that if I can get through this, I will never have to know that kind of hatred again. Get me through this keyhole. I can't fit through this by myself. What you fear is that if I learn to love this much, I will never be ordinary again, except that that's not the way I didn't want to be ordinary. I wanted to be extraordinary in a glamorous way. I wanted to be extraordinary in a noticeable way. This is not how I wanted to be extraordinary. I did not want to be extraordinary in my capacity to be compassionate. I did not want to be extraordinary in my capacity to feel the pain of others. I did not want this as my charism. I did not want you to make me able to feel the pain of people I do not like so that I may love them. If that's the price I have to pay to go through this hole, this is gonna shatter me. That you wake me up to love people I would choose to not love and this is not fair. But I can't, I stand between becoming hateful or loving except that the price I pay is that I love those I would choose not to love. And that is a hell of a price. Are you with me here? So that your highest potential is that you are sent to love those who you would choose never to love. That's your highest potential. And you could sit back and say, oh no, that sucks. <laughs> and it does. And it does. And then you find out how much love you have. That's when you find out, whoa, I am made of steel. I am made of steel. And that's when people start asking you, what are you doing? What are you doing with those people? What are you doing with those people? And that's when you look at them and say, I haven't got a clue, but I'll see you later. <laughs> are you nuts? And you think, I sure hope so. Man, I hope so. I've worked so hard. Are you with me now? <laughs> yeah. You mean Republicans? <laughs> Absolutely. That's when I say to my dog, bite, bite. <laughs> okay, so you're following me here. Okay. So this whole thing now about calling is that you are called to become something greater than yourself, but not for you, not just for you. 
and that those that I have seen cross this healing Rubicon finally get that it's not just about me. It's not just about me. And one of the greatest truths you can get is that you are under obligation to heal. And not because of you, but because of a cosmic calling. And that does not necessarily mean the release of your illness, but how well you heal, you carry your illness. If that is what you must carry, becomes your healing. And even that becomes a tribute to something greater than yourself. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That, however, it is at that higher altitude level, the perception at that level is, and this is, this is a toughie, Brownie, it's that whatever it is I am carrying, I no longer define as an illness, even though my body may not be perfectly well. That I must carry it within the perception that I don't know why my body has this or my mind or this, but I'm not going to see it as an illness brought about through negativity because I don't know if negativity did this. I don't believe that anymore. One of the issue, one of the whole framework of the new age is that negativity creates illness and that's nonsense. If that were the case, everybody in Washington DC would be sick and dead. Everybody, every, no, no, I'm serious. Everybody in, in, in China, all our world leaders, why is Castro one of the oldest living dictators? People who have murdered people. Excuse me, but that is the biggest bunch of nonsense. It is nothing but nonsense. Nonsense. It is that you may have negativity certainly influences us, but if you think that every single illness can be tracked to a negative thought, you better think that again. Because I'd say that people who are murderers, who start wars, who do things like that, and they are perfectly healthy. And not an ounce of conscience. Not an ounce. And they don't have any problem why they're living a really happy little life. Bankers, MPs who steal. Read your own headlines. <laughs> Homes in Barbados, San Tropez. They don't have any problem. Do they have problems? You think they have problems with their health? New Agers have more problems. You guys have more problems. You're rickety, <laughs> neurotic. Stomach disorders, allergies, you name it, you've got it. Depression, you name it, you've got it. You can't get over anything. I know, I've been with you. Two years, you still got it. Then, they steal, they lie, they cheat, they murder. They're healthy as anything. So don't tell me negativity is the root of disease. I will never, ever believe that. Hmm? Right. Just to prove that you're right, like science has backed up what you just said, was I received something from Spiritual Cinema Circle, and it was to Spiritual help. what? Spiritual Cinema Circle. Have you uh -huh. ever heard of that? No. And a big ad campaign they had was uh, to prove that watching movies that were positive could make you healthy. So I looked up their quote, which was by uh, Dr. McClellan. He died in 1989, and he was a Harvard psychologist, a professor at the university. And he did a study. And he took two control groups. Mm -hmm. And he took the uh, saliva of both groups at the very <laughs> beginning of the test. Typical. Yeah, and did an immunoglobulin A level test, mm -hmm. which is responsible for our immune system and preventing the common cold and that kind of thing. So both test groups, A and B, and the A group, he exposed to negative stimuli, like movies about Nazi criminals and murders and mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. horrible things for people to watch. Mm -hmm. And then he measured their immunoglobulin A levels at the end. And then group B, he exposed to things like people arriving at the airport and hugging and Mother Teresa and babies and puppies and wonderful things. And then he took their levels at the end. And what he found out was that the negative group, um, their levels, changed not at all, mm -hmm. not even noticeably. Mm -hmm. Like barely the statistics showed that there was absolutely no change. 
But the cool part was the positive ones, the ones that were exposed to positive things, their immunoglobulin A levels Dropped. went up. 49%. No, they went up. Oh. So negativity had no effect, but positive had an incredible effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was just what you were sort right. of saying. Didn't make them sicker. It didn't make them sicker. Yeah, did not make them sicker. Didn't even phase them. Doesn't phase. Zero. Why? Because the culture endorses it. Because the culture doesn't have a collective moral conscience. There's no cultural endorsement. There's no cultural. We, it's such a soft cushion in the culture. We do anything wrong, what do they do? Oh, shame on you. Okay, next day, it's all gone. There's no cultural consequence here. It doesn't matter. That's precisely it, dear. Because the culture endorses it, maybe they don't have any negative thoughts about it. That's so right. That, so that's not a that's not a measure of um, negativity at work because there's no negativity going on. Maybe the negativity is in us because we've got guilt and shame and we take things too but seriously. But we don't. Oh, about that. Well, whatever. We we'll take things on too seriously and beat ourselves up. Well, no. It's just well, a thought. I'm not sure about that, but I am sure about this, and that the culture has become amoral. It has become insensitized. It doesn't care about moral consequences. It has no sense whatsoever, and it has, in fact, given up totally. It looks at what the MPs are doing. It looks at it, and it says, shame on them. Isn't that good? They're going to get them, and turns around and looks the other way. Nobody stays on it. Nobody cares. And in fact, they just assume that, that's, that they're going to. Now they assume that these people will get away with it. There was once upon a time when you would assume that the shame of it would do them in. Now you just assume they're going to get away with it. No, well, that's just the way it is. They're so corrupt. Now the assumption is they're so corrupt that that's simply the way it is. There is absolutely no functioning conscience that stands as the polar opposite. With, and there has to be a functioning polar opposite that says, in order for negativity to make you sick, there has to be a conscience that says it's negative. Are you, are you with me? We take those off the planet. Huh? We take them off the planet. That's why they don't stand historically. People stand with those figureheads and historically get assassinated. Assassinated. You got a Gandhi, you got this or that, and it's like you don't stay here very long. Get them off. Only the good die young, as they say. So, yeah. So, anyway, that's enough of that. But you, let's go back to where I was I going. I just wanted to say if you want your voice on the DVD, you have to talk through the mic. Otherwise, you are not. So, that's your responsibility a little bit. Okay, okay Hannah. <laughs> Orders. <laughs> Okay, so now let's just go into the prelude to John. Um, so when John did his dark night, the active night I talked to you about, the first level was the active night, and I talked to you about when he said the first level of the dark night was the active night. In the active night, it was, the, he says, the night of the senses, that in the first level of the dark night, God crushes your sensory system. That it's a time when, and think about this, your first stage of dealing with any crisis is first you're going to say, I don't understand how this happened, why this is happening. You'll go for reason. And a lot of times, how many of you get stuck in the reasoning aspect? I've got to find a reason for this. There's got to be a reason for this. There's got to be some kind of reason why things hap this has happened to me as it did. And how many of you? Okay. That comes from the belief 
that God is a reasonable being, that there's an off-planet, there's actually an off-planet being living somewhere out there who reasons just like us, only times 100. And we have a belief in this reasoning being that he reasons just like us. And that's called our theology. Okay? And that somehow or other, this off-planet God that we've made up, that we, we think that thinks he's got a reason just like us, that if we could figure out how this being reasons and we could contact this being and negotiate that whatever crisis we happen, have happen to be in will be undone and will be returned to the way things were. And that is a very common belief. During the active dark night, you, you will sit in this orbit of believing these things until you finally give it up, until you finally accept in some part that something has happened to you that you cannot reason with or cannot reason your way through. That's the active. The, and let me say that the, um, the way that we've set up our healing, unfortunately, follows the, I didn't say unfortunately, it just the way it is, follows the active dark night. We're in so many therapies, it's go back and find a reason, go back and find the reason. What was your childhood like? What was this? Who did what to you? Maybe that's a reason why you became sick. That's a reason why your relationships don't work. Whatever, we'll leave that. The passive dark night is when I saw where the power was. The second part of the dark night is when I saw another pattern of seven. And that's when John of the Cross says, where the real work is, is when you go into the seven shadow passions of the soul. He said, it's here that you discover how much power you actually have in your soul and how you're using that power and why you use your power the way you do. And the seven shadow passions are in classic literature called the seven sins. Okay? And they are the seven they are the seven archetypal shadows of the soul. And I match those to the seven force, force graces that they are partnered with. So when you think about this, in each one of these chakras is a grace shadow passion relationship that spins as if right there is the center point. And the grace shadow relationship that power spins everything else into motion. So that in your first chakra, this is your tribe. This is your tribal, just to give you an experience of it. This is your tribal chakra. And in your tribe, this whole area is where what, what's locked in is everything about your family, your traditions, all of that, your... Uh, everything that roots you, your superstitions, who you are, but think of the subtleties. What did your family say? And what do you say to your family? Because none of you are spring chickens, so you all have children that you've passed things down to. So what have you said to your children that you expect of them? What have you said? So never mind what they've been said to you. What have you done? What's the damage you've done? Come on, fess up. What have you done? What, what are your children saying in therapy about you? Yeah. Oh, God, is that bright? Yeah, I haven't been um, very open, and the way that I express my love to my daughter is um, I've always been a bit embarrassed. My parents didn't do that with me, and I felt a bit awkward with her, and so there's this thing, although I love her, and we both love each other. I don't hug her too much. or There's not a lot of touching. So I think she'd probably say, and I think I'd probably pass that on to her. 
you know, so I think if she was in therapy, she'd say, my dad um, isn't very, um, like, uh, what, what would you call someone that, affectionate, yeah. Yeah, demonstrative, affectionate. Well said, yeah. you. Okay. Brilliant. The shadow passion of this is pride. Let's just jump in. The shadow passion right here is pride. It's too much for your pride to do that. Okay, it's pride. This is a shadow, and the grace is reverence. Reverence. It's the grace and the sacred. Okay. This is a big deal here. This is also the first mansion. So I'm going to put these all together because we're going to blend these. The first mansion is humility and chaos. Okay, so this is such a big deal. Because in your first mansion, that shadow of, am I going to be humiliated? Will, will she reject me? Will she, and my pride couldn't take it. My pride can't take it. So instead, that completely, think about that. That completely controls you, and as a result, that grace of the sacred, that grace of holding someone in reverence is withheld, completely withheld. The roots, you are reverent to me, you are everything, you are sacred. I can't, com you want to communicate that, but what happens, follow me with this, is while the grace is there, it's everywhere, it's tactile, you can, may I have your name? Nick, while Nick feels it in every part of himself, you have to take the experience of that grace and t tune it down from visceral to making it mental. Because you can't, you can't allow yourself to actually express it. And the reason you can't is because your pride is stronger than the grace. So, so it, the pride wins out over the grace. The pride wins out. Okay. Now I'm just going to walk you through all of this and in, in, in all that is connected here. Because in this, we're going to atta attach it to you are so in the center point of your first chakra to say that this is a PowerPoint of major creation for you. You, you. you have to see this image here. It's a flat image, but picture it like a gargantuan hourglass, okay, that you're, you're standing on so that this first chakra is pretty big. And that whoever steps onto the field of your first chakra, you size them up through a sense of, will they humiliate me? Anyone you see, your first thought is, am I strong enough to humiliate them first or take them down or will they humiliate me or where do I stand with this person? Every single person, that's exactly how you do it. What's the first thing you think of? Of every single person you see, the very first thing is, humiliate, be humiliated. I don't care if you use that word, that's what your instinct is. That's what you're sniffing them out for. Who will take who down first if it comes to humiliation? Rejection, that's another word. You want to use that one? And that's exactly, exactly, exactly what you're doing in your first. And the whole way you conduct yourself with that person is let them step on your territory and offend your, what is the word? Pride. Offend your pride. Offend your pride. Well, they stepped on my... Or, and what's another word we use there? Our, our pride really offended my, our nationality. You speak with an hour there. Do you know how many times I've learned because of my years on the road to always walk with great respect in anyone else's nation? Always be very careful because it takes nothing, or even my own country when I meet someone from another nation, to always show deep respect, deep 
What's the grace? Reverence for another country. And because I'm so fluent in history, there's usually a lot I respect about every country. Um, so that's not a difficult thing for me to do. But it is amazing to me that the moment we talk about another country, especially if it is a delicate subject, the individual in front of me becomes a we. Well, we always. And suddenly there's a we in front of me. And it's not an I, it's a we. We who? And suddenly there's an entire nation standing in one person. Okay? No, 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 this is a big deal, everybody. You don't get what I am saying to you. You've got to get what I'm saying to you. Because now I'm talking about your immune system. That I am now talking about who's susceptible to an epidemic and who is not. Because an epidemic is a tribal disease. And it's global. A pandemic, epidemic is a tribal disease. And it hits exactly through the first chakra. Exactly through the first chakra. All epidemics. They strike. When, why and when do they come up when they do? Why do, why do we develop epidemics as we do culturally? Societies, why do they come up with epidemics? What's the H1N1? What's that about? What's AIDS about? What's, why does the planet have AIDS now? Fear? Nope. Nope, it's victim consciousness. The, if you look at the um, physical manifestations, it's environmental. The planetary body has AIDS. The, it has pneumocystis, which is the breakdown of the physical body of the earth and the lungs of the earth. Pneumocystis is the lungs of a person. And of course, the destruction of the rainforest, the destruction of the air, chaos, kaposi sarcoma, which is the, the, the physical, the skin, the expression on the skin, which is the body layer of the earth. And of course, the immune system, which is the ozone. So what is in one is in the whole, and AIDS is the disease to come to the aid of, to come to the aid of the environment. And it thrives where there is victim consciousness. Within the African states, within it struck within the homosexual community in the United States, which of course at the time had absolutely, well, under the Republicans, still no rights. Still no rights. Okay, victimized surrogate for, of course, it just thrived. So it is very serious victim culture. Polio, another, vic, uh, another disease, when it struck, when it did, it hit an epidemic proportion. If you look just within the United States in 1929, the stock market crashes. Polio epidemic right after. Language in the country, we are economically crippled. Crippled was the language we used. We were crippled. We get a virus that reflects it. We stay that way till after World War II, when we had, in fact, a president who was crippled with polio. And then after World War II, when we felt we were economically, quote, on our feet again, that's the language we used, that's the metaphor we used, Jonas Salk was able to bring forth the vaccine, and boom, it was over. A vaccine, a virus vaccine that completely parallel, parallel, paralleled exactly the tribal psyche. We have the H1N1 that they consider to be a global pandemic. Okay, what is being struck at? 
is the absence of reverence on a global level. There's no reverence for life anywhere. The absence of reverence. I'm going to ask you to look through this lens and see it in action. That one of the truths that people are disconnected to in mass, and you can say, well, the people that you hang with are very small in proportion to the number of people out there. So don't judge by your personal group of people. But this sense of what is reverence and what does it mean to have reverence, a grace of reverence. What is reverence? Reverence is a grace that animates your sense of the sacredness of life, your life. Having a sense that it is a sacred gift to be alive. If you've ever had the experience of being with someone who is dying, who says to you, I have to tell you that my life is very valuable. Life is very valuable. And if I knew then what I know now, these are the choices I would make. I never realized that this was important or that I was important or how important you were. And what falls away in those last stages is pride. And how pride has prevented somebody from seeing the reverence in another person. What falls away is the shadow of pride. And they're able to see clearly and act on the grace of reverence and say, I have always held you dear. I've just never been able to say it. And I am so sorry. Those deathbed apologies are when the grace of reverence comes through and it is tragic that you wait till then. But so many people wait till then. And they can't live with themselves when they haven't had the chance. And pride has stuck in the way of being able to connect to someone without that reverence if, they've let, if someone has passed on. And this is the grace we're talking about. To not experience that grace about your own life you know it's not there if you feel shame about your own life because of something, because you are in the sense of, I don't have this stuff. I don't have this. I'm unaccomplished. I need this and this and this and this and this to feel good about the fact that I have a life. I don't, I'm not, I don't have enough stuff. I don't have, because why? Because my tribe said, in order for me to be anything at all, I need to have and be the following. What did your tribe tell you? What's in your head? That in order for you to even res respect that you have been given life, which is what feeds your immune system, we're in the first chakra. In order for you to even animate the sense that you are reverent, that you are sacred, that you are holy, for you to even go near that truth, you have a whole standard of things you have to live up to that your tribe first has to say, okay, now, now. So you haven't even gone near that grace because you dwell in this shadow. And if you dwell in this shadow, you, it is impossible for you to give that grace to another person. Because you only encounter them with your shadow and, and the only way you show that you have dignity is to show them that your pride can be offended. How dare you speak to me that way? How dare you? The only way you can show anybody that you have any kind of sense of anything is to make sure they know you have offendable pride. How dare you talk to me that way? 
How dare I talk to you what way? Instead of having that sense, and you'll never understand the difference, this is first mansion, between the protection of the shield of humbleness and your pathological fear of being humiliated. You won't get it. You won't get it. But you'll be completely controlled by the fear of being humiliated. Because that's what false pride is. So for your homework tonight, I have to set you home. For your homework tonight, this is just first chakra. This is just your first shadow. Just first, 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 first. And we have just begun the first. We haven't even gone. What I want you to do is name 10 things in your first. 10. 10. Where pride has and, rem and how it affects. Look at, look at the issue that you're working on, please. And how issues of pride serve keeping that issue unhealthy. Nope. Yeah, at least 10. Yeah. How they're involved, how issues of pride are involved in what you're trying to heal. Or in some suffering in your life. But issues of pride, how it is, how they're totally involved. But tie in what you're trying to heal. Okay? And let's go to the grace of reverence. Reverence is about you and the sacred. Reverence is about you seeing, feeling this experience of sa the sacred. I just want you to be really still for a second, okay? Just be really still for a second. And just that deep prayer that says, Sort of like the way Teresa always prayed. And she is everything to me. One of her deep prayers, she always began with, let nothing disturb the quiet of my moment with you, God. Grant that the grace of reverence be given to my soul this evening. As I sleep, fill me with the grace of reverence. Let me experience what it is to feel sacred about this gift of my life. Let me feel what it is to be sacred. I have no idea what that feels like. I have no sense of it. I have never felt sacred. I have no idea what that is like. I ask to feel, to awaken to that grace of reverence and that I may see others as reverent. What a grace. Okay, everybody, I will see you in the morning. I don't know what time. What are we supposed to be here? 9.15, says, say it, John. Okay, everybody, have a wonderful night. <laughs>